Hello, welcome to the course. So, why are you here? Well, I wouldn't presume to know your motivations, but I assume you've chosen to study this course because you're interested in understanding the world. Um, that is, after all, what systems theory is all about, or the study of differential equations. We have the world, and we want to explain it. And differential equations is the natural language for doing this. So, that still leaves open the question, why are you here? You've been studying differential equations for a long time. Why move on to study nonlinear differential equations? Well, I think the answer lies in that uh, an interest in understanding more complex behaviours. Now, you see, in previous courses, um, previous control courses, you focused almost exclusively on understanding linear systems or linear sets of differential equations, and you've developed tools for. Um, investigating equilibrium points and seeing if they're stable or unstable and then coming up with design methods to stabilize them if they're not stable and design for other measures of performance but you've always been kept in your linear bubble so this is sort of what uh, you've studied before linear systems and I don't want to give the impression that this is somehow useless. I mean, it's not. It's, it's very useful, and there's a lot of good theory here, but it is inherently restricted. Um, so you've always been forced to study things like equi equilibrium points and questions like stable or unstable. But the truth is, the world is capable of displaying much more exotic behaviours than just stable or unstable equilibrium points. Um, and what you may not have been aware is that um, you're not able to describe any of these richer behaviours within the framework of linear systems theory. Linear systems theory restricts you to this setting. So, what can you describe with nonlinear systems? What types of extra behaviours are out there? And what will this course all be about? Well, I'll give you a few examples. So, above we had uh, linear systems, and now let's have nonlinear systems. So, what will this step into a more general world let us do? Um, well, we'll be able to study a group of things, or a, a group of behaviours called limit cycles. So, what is a limit cycle and why would you be interested in it? Well, later in this lecture we'll go into this um, example in a little bit more detail, but uh, here is an example of a system which will display a limit cycle. Uh, this is called the van der Poel oscillator. Um, this is a q squared minus 1, q dot plus q is equal to 0. So this is just a differential equation in the variable q. q double dot is its second derivative with respect to time, and we've got some kind of mix of q dots and q squareds and q's and q double dots, and this is not a nonlinear equation, and we'll explain a little... Uh, this is not a linear equation, sorry, and we'll explain a little bit more why that is later, but the giveaway sign is that you have Q's multiplied with other stuff or squares, and this is sort of a typical nonlinear type equation. And now let's just simulate it. So we go away to our solver of choice, um, and we simulate the trajectories of the system to certain initial conditions. So let's take the initial condition q dot at time t is equal to zero equal to zero. So if q is position and q dot is velocity, this is saying that your velocity is originally zero. And then our position, say, is some nominal uh, value. And if we simulate this system for one initial condition, we end up getting a trajectory. So this is q0, this is q, and this is time. And we simulate it and we get these sort of weird oscillations. They look something like that. Okay, that's not particularly interesting yet. What's really interesting though is when we start at a different initial condition. So let's say instead we start at this point here and we simulate the system. 
And what happens this time is maybe we go down. And we get another kind of oscillating um, solution. It seems to have a very similar shape to the original one. It's a shifted version. And we've almost pinned down all the properties of this solution that make it a limit cycle. And that is that for a set of different initial conditions, in fact, for any initial condition, this will happen, we'll um, tend to this fixed periodic solution where the amplitude remains fixed and the period remains the same. It might be, they might be shifted from each other, but the period will be the same. And th these are the characteristics of a limit cycle. So why is this interesting? Well, this is saying that this particular system, no matter where we start, it'll slip into an entirely predictable periodic rhythm with a fixed amplitude. And now imagine that you're trying to describe the behavior of your heart. This is exactly what your heart does. So throughout your life, your heart is beating at this near constant rhythm with the same amplitude and the same period. And this is a, a, a property that cannot be described by linear systems. Linear systems just describe points, equilibrium points, and behavior around those points. The natural behavior of your heart isn't a point, it's this periodic behavior, and this is exactly what a limit cycle is. So this is our first kind of fundamentally nonlinear behavior that we'll be investiga investigating through the course. Um, so what else can uh, nonlinear systems do? Well, you can get systems that are only stable in certain regions. So this is often called finite region of attraction. And um, also later in the lecture, we'll go on and do an example of this, but let's just draw some pictures to see what this might look like. So we're going to imagine now that we're studying the spread of a disease throughout a population. And we're going to study that through some uh, variable um, i. And this is the number of infectious people. Just people. And so we have some disease spreading through a population. And let's say we also have some test and trace system that's going away and testing people who we think are infectious um, and then isolating them if uh, the test says yes. Um, and now let's just try to imagine how a system like this might behave. So the, the key thing to think about is do you think this system will be able to cope with arbitrary number of cases? So if we have a lot of infectious people that we need to test and trace, what's going to happen? So let's just draw some candidate trajectories and we'll get into this example in a bit more detail in a little bit. But so suppose here on the y-axis we have the number of infectious people i. And again, we start with a small infection, well, if a, a small um, outbreak. So we a very small number of people have the disease, and then um, we try and test and trace them. Well, if the, the number's very small, our test and trace system might be able to keep up and isolate all, the, all of those that are infectious and prevent the spread of the disease. And so we might get a trajectory that looks something like that. So we started with a very small number of people. It sort of went up a little bit, but then our test and trace system caught up and isolated everyone and prevented the spread and things will all be very similar so if maybe I had even fewer people who were infectious my test and trace system could keep up with that but now what would happen if the the number of infectious people was quite a bit larger and maybe pushing the capacity of your test and trace system, especially if you're doing this over the phone, say, and so you need people to like ring up everyone's friends and say you need to isolate. Clearly, if there's a lot of people to ring up, the system will get overwhelmed and get saturated. Now, what, uh, might, what, uh, what might happen? Well, instead of just this little bump um, that, that's contained, now the system might just get completely overwhelmed. So things sort of might start off okay, and then we get overwhelmed, and then we end up with a huge outbreak before eventually everyone just recovers of their own accord. And so what we see is another fundamentally nonlinear behavior for just 
small scalings or well indeed for any scalings for scalings of your initial conditions you might end up with completely different behaviors and if you think about linear systems this is something that can't happen and we'll explain a bit why soon um, but this is another fundamentally non-linear behavior for different scalings of your initial conditions, your response can be wildly different and maybe you'll be stable or perform very well for small, but perform disastrously for large. So this is sort of what we mean by finite regions of attraction. And kind of the third, um, uh, well, there's many more examples, but the third one that we'll sort of focus on in this lecture and really in the course is that of multiple equilibria. And so what might that look and look like and why might it be useful? Well, again, we'll study another famous example. This is a bistable uh, circuit example. In this case, the differential equation is q dot plus, uh, sorry, q double dot plus q dot. And this time the nonlinear bit is being stuck on the, the q term. So I put a mu q squared minus one. Q is equal to zero, and just like before, let's use the same initial condition. What happens this time? Well, if we just go away and simulate our system to see what happens, we get two interesting behaviors. So if Q if we start here and we just simulate, so this is our initial condition, um, we simulate what happens, we get some curve depending exactly on what the parameters are that might do something like that. And the point is that it tends to some uh, value up here. So that was just a mistake. So if we initialize our system here um, and just simulate, the trajectory will tend go up here, so that our value of q will settle down to a value of 1. But if we pick a different initial condition, say we pick an initial condition down here, it will tend to a completely different point, and it'll settle down over here to minus 1 instead. And in fact, these are the two things that can happen. If you start above the, um, so, so for positive initial conditions, you tend to one, and for negative initial conditions, you tend to minus one. So we have this system, which has got two distinct stable equilibrium points. And this is something that can't happen in linear systems either. So why is this useful? Well, imagine that we're trying to build some memory for a computer. So we want to be able to program what this memory can store, and in the case of um, computers, you store ones or zeros. So we want, depending on what we choose, our system for storing memory to settle down and permanently stay in a position corresponding to a one and a position corresponding to a zero, depending on what we want to put in our memory. Well, that's exactly what you can achieve with a system with multiple equilibrium points. So here, just by varying the initial condition or, or varying the input to your memory, you can force it to settle down to one equilibrium point, which might correspond to, say, storing a one, or settle down to another equi equilibrium point, which would correspond to storing a zero. And once we're there, it will stay there until we provide another input to push us into uh, to the other equilibrium point when we want to change um, what our memory is storing. So this is sort of three kind of interesting non-linear behaviors that cannot be described um, within the framework of linear systems theory. And really at its heart, that's what this course is all about. It's about developing a language and a framework for understanding nonlinear behaviors and things that you couldn't explain um, with linear systems alone. And actually, as you'll see, linear systems uh, theory will still have quite a big part to play in explaining all of this stuff. So it's not like this was useless. Um, but we just need to sort of uh, reshape it and remould it a little bit and add in a few extra ingredients to allow us to describe these um, richer classes of behaviour that are very useful when describing the world at large.